Ancient Lights by Algernon Blackwood From Southwater, where he left the train, the road led due west. That he knew, for the rest he trusted to luck, being one of those born walkers who dislike asking the way. He had that instinct, and as a rule it served him well. A mile or so due west, along the sandy road, till you come to a stile on the right. Then across the fields, you'll see the red house straight before you. He glanced at the postcard's instructions once again, and once again he tried to decipher the scratched-out sentence without success. It had been so elaborately inked over that no word was legible. Inked-out sentences in a letter were always enticing. He wondered what it was that had to be so very carefully obliterated. The afternoon was boisterous, with a tearing, shouting wind that blew from the sea across the Sussex Weald. Massive clouds with rounded, piled-up edges, cannoned across gaping spaces of blue sky. Far away the line of downs swept the horizon like an arriving wave. Shanktonbury Ring rode their crest, a scudding ship hull down before the wind. He took his hat off and walked rapidly, breathing great draughts of air with delight and exhilaration. The road was deserted, no horsemen, bicycles, or motors, not even a tradesman cart, no single walker. But anyhow, he would never have asked the way. Keeping a sharp eye for the stile, he pounded along, while the wind tossed the cloak against his face and made waves across the blue puddles in the yellow road. The trees showed their underleaves of white. The bracken and the high new grass bent all one way. Great life was in the day, high spirits and dancing everywhere. And for a Croydon surveyor's clerk just out of an office, this was like a holiday at the sea. It was a day for high adventure, and his heart rose up to meet the mood of nature. His umbrella with the silver ring ought to have been a sword, and his brown shoes should have been top boots with spurs upon the heels. Where hid the enchanted castle and the princess with the hair of sunny gold? His horse. The stile came suddenly into view and nipped adventure in the bud. Every day clothes took him prisoner again. He was a surveyor's clerk, middle-aged, earning three pounds a week, coming from Croydon to see about a client's proposed alterations in a wood, something to ensure a better view from the dining room window. Across the fields, perhaps a mile away, he saw the red house gleaming in the sunshine, and resting on the stile a moment to get his breath, he noticed a copse of oak and hornbeam on the right. Aha, he told himself, so that must be the wood he wants cut down to improve the view. I'll have a look at it. The boards were up, of course, but there was an inviting little path as well. Oh, I'm not a trespasser, he said. It's part of my business, this is. He scrambled awkwardly over the gate and entered the copse. A little round would bring him to the field again. But the moment he passed among the trees, the wind ceased shouting, and a stillness dropped upon the world. So dense was the growth that the sunshine only came through in isolated patches. The air was close. He mopped his forehead and put his green felt hat on, but a low branch knocked it off again at once. And as he stooped, an elastic twig swung back and stung his face. There were flowers along both edges of the little path, glades opened on either side, ferns curved about in damper corners, and the smell of earth and foliage was rich and sweet. It was cooler here. What an enchanting little wood, he thought turning down a small green glade where the sunshine flickered like silver wings. How it danced and fluttered and moved about. He put a dark blue flower in his buttonhole. Again, his hat, caught by an oak branch as he rose, was knocked from his head, falling across his eyes. And this time he did not put it on again. Swinging his umbrella, he walked on with uncovered head, whistling rather loudly as he went but the thickness of the trees hardly encouraged whistling, and something of his gaiety and high spirits seemed to leave him. He suddenly found himself treading circumspectly and with caution. The stillness in the wood was so peculiar. There was a rustle among the ferns and leaves, and something shot across the path ten yards ahead, 
stopped abruptly an instant with head cocked sideways to stare, then dived again beneath the underbrush with the speed of a shadow. He started like a frightened child, laughing the next second that a mere pheasant could have made him jump. In the distance, he heard wheels upon the road and wondered why the sound was pleasant. Good old butcher's cart, he said to himself, then realized that he was going in the wrong direction and had somehow got turned around, for the road should be behind him, not in front. And he hurriedly took another narrow glade that lost itself in greenness to the right. That's my direction, of course, he said. The trees has mixed me up a bit, it seems. Then found himself abruptly by the gate he had first climbed over. He had merely made a circle. Surprise became almost discomfiture then and a man dressed like a gamekeeper in brownie green leaned against the gate, hitting his legs with a switch. "'I'm making for Mr. Lumley's farm,' explained the walker. "'This is his wood, I believe.' Then stopped dead, because it was no man at all, but merely an effect of light and shade and foliage. He stepped back to reconstruct the singular illusion, but the wind shook the branches roughly here on the edge of the wood, and the foliage refused to reconstruct the figure. The leaves all rustled strangely, and just then the sun went behind a cloud, making the whole wood look otherwise. Yet how the mind could be thus doubly deceived was indeed remarkable, for it almost seemed to him the man had answered, spoken. Or was this the shuffling noise the branches made, and had pointed with his switch to the notice board upon the nearest tree? The words rang on his head, but of course he had imagined them. No, it's not his wood, it's ours. And some village wit, moreover, had changed the lettering in the weather-beaten board, for it read quite plainly, Trespassers will be persecuted. And while the astonished clerk read the words and chuckled, he said to himself, thinking what a tale he'd have to tell his wife and children later, the bloomin' wood has tried to chuck me out, but I'll go in again. Why, it's only a matter of a square acre at most. I'm bound to reach the field on the other side if I keep straight on. He remembered his position in the office. He had a certain dignity to maintain. The cloud passed from below the sun, and light splashed suddenly in all manner of unlikely places. The man went straight on. He felt a touch of puzzling confusion somewhere. This way the cops had of shifting from sunshine into shadow doubtless troubled sight a little. To his relief, at last, a new glade opened through the trees and disclosed the fields, with a glimpse of the red house in the distance at the far end. But a little wicket gate that stood across the path had first to be climbed, and as he scrambled heavily over, for it would not open, he got the astonishing feeling that it slid off sideways beneath his weight and towards the wood. Like the moving staircases at Herod's and Earl's Court, it began to glide off with him. It was quite horrible. He made a violent effort to get down before it carried him into the trees, but his feet became entangled with the bars and umbrella so that he fell heavily upon the farther side, arms spread across the grass and nettles, Boots clutched between the first and second bars. He lay there a moment like a man crucified upside down, and while he struggled to get disentangled, feet, bars, and umbrella formed a rectangular net. He saw the little man in brownie green go past him with extreme rapidity through the wood. The man was laughing. He passed across the glade some fifty yards away, and he was not alone this time. A companion like himself went with him, the clerk, now upon his feet again, watched them disappear into the gloom of green beyond. They're tramps, not gamekeepers, he said to himself, half mortified, half angry. But his heart was thumping dreadfully, and he dared not utter all his thought. He examined the wicket gate, convinced it was a trick gate somehow, then went hurriedly on again, disturbed beyond belief to see that the glade no longer opened into fields, but curved away to the right. What in the world had happened to him? His sight was so utterly at fault. Again the sun flamed out abruptly and lit the floor of the wood with pools of silver, 
and at the same moment a violent gust of wind passed shouting overhead. Drops fell clattering everywhere upon the leaves, making a sharp pattering as of many footsteps. The whole copse shuddered and went moving. Rain, by George, thought the clerk, and feeling for his umbrella, discovered he had lost it. He turned back to the gate and found it lying on the farther side. To his amazement, he saw the fields at the far end of the glade, the red house, too, a shine in the sunset. He laughed then, for, of course, in his struggle with the gate, he had somehow got turned around, had fallen back instead of forwards. Climbing over, this time quite easily, he retraced his steps. The silver band, he saw, had been torn from the umbrella. No doubt his foot, a nail, or something had caught at it and ripped it off. The clerk began to run. He felt extraordinarily dismayed. But while he ran, the entire wood ran with him, round him, to and fro, trees shifting like living things, leaves folding and unfolding, trunks darting backwards and forwards, and branches disclosing enormous empty spaces, then closing up again before he could look into them. There were footsteps everywhere, and laughing, crying voices, and crowds of figures gathering just behind his back till the glade, he knew, was thick with moving life. The wind in his ears, of course, produced the voices and the laughter, while the sun and clouds plunging the corpse alternately in shadow and bright, dazzling light created the figures. But he did not like it, and went as fast as ever his sturdy legs could take him. He was frightened now. This was no story for his wife and children. He ran like the wind, but his feet made no sound upon the soft, mossy turf. Then, to his horror, he saw that the glade grew narrow. Nettles and weeds stood thick across it. It dwindled down into a tiny path, and twenty yards ahead it stopped finally and melted off among the trees. What the trick gate had failed to achieve, this twisting glade accomplished easily, carried him in bodily among the dense and crowding trees. There was only one thing to do. Turn sharply and dash back again, run headlong into the life that followed at his back, followed so closely too that now it almost touched him, pushing him in. And with reckless courage, this was what he did. It seemed a fearful thing to do. He turned with a sort of violent spring, head down and shoulders forward, hands stretched before his face. He made the plunge, like a hunted creature, he charged full tilt the other way, meeting the wind now in his face. Good Lord! The glade behind him had closed up as well. There was no longer any path at all. Turning around and round like an animal at bay, he searched for an opening, a way of escape, searched frantically, breathlessly, terrified now in his bones. But foliage surrounded him, branches blocked the way. The trees stood close and still, unshaken by a breath of wind, and the sun dipped that moment behind a great black cloud. The entire wood turned dark and silent. It watched him. Perhaps it was this final touch of sudden blackness that made him act so foolishly, as though he had really lost his head. At any rate, without pausing to think, he dashed headlong in among the trees again. There was a sensation of being stiflingly surrounded and entangled, and that he must break out at all costs, out and away into the open of the blessed fields and air. He did this ill-considered thing, and apparently charged straight into an oak that deliberately moved into his path to stop him. He saw it shift across a good full yard, and being a measuring man, accustomed to theodolite and chain, he ought to know. He fell, saw stars, and felt a thousand tiny fingers tugging and pulling at his hands and neck and ankles. The stinging nettles, no doubt, were responsible for this. He thought of it later. At the moment... It felt diabolically calculated. But another remarkable illusion was not so easily explained. For all in a moment, it seemed the entire wood went sliding past him with a thick, deep rustling of leaves and laughter, myriad footsteps, and tiny, little, active, energetic shapes. Two men in brownie green gave him a mighty hoist, and he opened his eyes to find himself lying in the meadow beside the stile where first his incredible adventure had begun. The wood stood in its usual place and stared down upon him in the sunlight. There was the red house in the distance as before. Above him grinned the weather-beaten notice board. Trespassers will be prosecuted. Disheveled in mind and body, 
and a good deal shaken in his official soul, the clerk walked slowly across the fields. But on the way, he glanced once more at the postcard of instructions, and saw with dull amazement that the inked-out sentence was quite legible after all beneath the scratches made across it. There is a shortcut through the woods. The wood I want cut down, if you care to take it. Only care was so badly written, it looked more like another word. The C was uncommonly like D. That's the copse that spoils my view of the downs, you see, his client explained to him later, pointing across the fields and referring to the ordnance map beside him. I want it cut down and a path made so-and-so. His finger indicated direction on the map. The fairy wood, it's still called, and it's far older than this house. Come now, if you're ready, Mr. Thomas, we might go out and have a look at it. This ends the reading of Ancient Lights by Algernon Blackwood.